invite you to, to be seated uh, for, for a moment. If uh, one more time, if, if I didn't get it, if I didn't get it through in the, in the opening welcome, uh, I don't know that I can help you. But if you're welcome, but just one more try. If you are a guest with us this morning and you do not consider yourself a religious person, we are especially glad that you are here. We would invite you to hang around here long enough, and you will discover that we aren't all that religious people. So, that's about as honest as I can be. I heard somebody say once that every life, every life on this planet is a sermon. Every life is a sermon, and in every new day we preach, your life preaches a sermon point. And maybe it's true, I don't know. But I know this, I have, uh, because of my job, I have been to more than a thousand church services. I have preached over 300 sermons at this church, and I, I can honestly remember the content of about three of my sermons. One was when I swore in the middle of a sermon. That's on YouTube. Um, there, there, was another, there was another one where there was a small infant, a little boy, who just cried through the entire sermon, no matter how many times I said, son, please stop. <laughs> uh, that's, a true, that's a true story. It was, uh, it was a Christmas Eve service, nonetheless. And I still claim him, so uh, I'm pretty sure it's not the last time he's going to do that. But if it's true that every person's life is a sermon, then I, I know this. Jesus preached the best sermon that I've ever heard. His life and what it pointed toward will remain with me. No doubt with many of you is a foundation upon which to build your families, your friendships, your faith. It's hard to imagine that a sermon on love has ever been said better. He gave his life for us all. Yet we're all here to preach one sermon to leave our legacy, as it were. And you can choose to leave a legacy of goodness, charity, mercy. You could choose to leave a legacy of selfishness. You could choose to leave a legacy of almost anything that you choose. And so I would encourage you, as we look at God's Word, to realize that the first purpose of your life, the reason that you're here, is to receive the love of God. Your purpose in this life is to receive God's steadfast, never-ending love. That is your first purpose on this planet. Your second purpose is to reflect that, to imitate that, to love God, and to love those around you. It sounds pretty simple, right? Receive God's love, and then love Him back, love everybody around you. The Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, tells us this. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. You're created in His image to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. So there it is on paper. That's the screen. On the screen, there it is. It's pretty simple. You're here on this planet to do good. God has created you in His image, prepared you with certain creative gifts. That you are unique. Your talents, your resources are unique, and the purpose is for you to be able to do good. It looks really easy, but if we were to look at human history, apparently it's not that easy. If we were to look at church history, apparently it's not that simple to live out. Because as we look at church history, we've got a pretty consistent legacy that people would rather debate beliefs, traditions, doctrines, than actually do what Jesus said. It's not rocket science, really. Just go. Do it. Practice loving a difficult person. Try forgiving someone. Give away some money. Tell someone thank you. Encourage a friend. Bless an enemy. Say, I'm sorry. Worship God. 
Friends, you already know more than you need to know. And so I thought that before we got too far along into this message, that it might be useful to remind all of us the story of the entire life of Jesus, from the beginning to the end, since he is the reason that we're gathered here today, right? I mean, I know the eggs are good too, but it is Easter. And I, you know this, if you've spent any amount of time here, you know that I like to tell stories. Um, anytime that I can work a story in, you know it's, it's coming. And so I've taken a story, I've put it to the music of a popular song, and you're welcome to listen along, and if by chance you know the familiar chord, then I would welcome you to, to sing along with us. The chorus. There's a good chance you don't know the. Uh, there's a good chance you don't know the rest of the song because we just we just we just wrote it. <laughs> and I and I say that because there are always a handful of people who go, oh yeah, I know this one. I'm going to sing along. And I don't think. I mean, maybe you're good. <laughs> you know this one.
for this one. This one is called Amazing Grace. Anybody ever heard of that? Uh, the person who put the words to that melody is named John Newton. John Newton wrote the lyrics to Amazing Grace. John Newton also tells uh, a long time ago, because John Newton lived, lived a long time ago, and he told this parable. Parable is simply very little, a story that tells a point. Jesus told a lot of parables. John Newton tells this parable about a man who was on his way to a big city, which are located north of Jewish Creek. He was on his way to a big city, and he was going to inherit a million dollars. Now, to go back several generations, a million dollars was a lot of money. I mean, it's a lot of money to me, and, and, and maybe some of you. But, but if we adjust, you know, cost of living increases and, and so on and so forth, let's call it in today's terms, it would be a billion with a B. Now, because I don't want you all to be skeptical, meet me halfway. Let's say the man was going to be to, to inherit a hundred million dollars, okay? Still a lot of money. You're on your way to a hundred million dollars. But I want to take it back to John Newton's time, because the way he tells the story, the man used a chariot, a stagecoach, not a car, not a jeep, not a bike. And so there you are, in your chariot, happy, on your way to inherit how much? <laughs> You're a mile away from the city for your inheritance, and guess what? The wheel falls off your chariot. Now this is a picture of your life, okay? You are this far from home. Home, for us, is eternal. We've all got souls that this life is just the beginning. Home is eternal, the great by and by. This life is called a vapor's breath. Two seconds, and you're this close to your inheritance. You really are. Statistically speaking, this is not me being morbid, but statistically speaking, some of us in this room will die in this year. Some of you are 70 years out. But in the big scheme of things, it's really the same. It's this close, and then it's forever. And so the man looks at his broken wheel, and he says, you know what? It's a mile. I can run. He can't run. He says, you know what? I'll walk. I'll walk to get my money. So he stumbles all the way into the city on his way to $100 million, and he's grumbling the whole way. My chariot is broken. My chariot is broken. That's our life. That's Dustin Sedlak in the mirror, and I hate it. And I don't pretend to think that I'm alone in missing the point of this life. Many of us have been so focused on the temporary things that we've lost sight of the eternal. We've gotten a little bit off course, and today is as good a day as it gets to get back on track. You know, where we could hit the reset button, get a fresh start, turn over a new leaf. Have you ever wished that, that life had a reset button and you could start over, get a fresh, clean, clear, new chance of life? Have you ever wished, have you ever wished you could just get a do over? A couple of hunters are out in the woods, doing what hunters do out in the woods, which is hunt. And suddenly, one of them falls to the ground. He does not seem to be breathing. His eyes are rolled back in his head. The man next to him pulls out his cell phone, and he calls emergency services. And he gasps to the woman on the other end of the phone, my friend is dead. What can I do? The operator, in a calm, soothing voice, says, Sir, it's okay. Let's just take it nice and easy. I can help. First off, are you really sure that he's dead? There's a silence on the other end of the phone. And then a loud gunshot is heard. <laughs> the man's voice comes back on the line, and he says, Okay, now what? <laughs> <laughs> That's my third time walking that dog, and the first two were rough. Now, fair warning, in 30 seconds, some of you will get it. <laughs> Come on, okay, good. I love Easter. <laughs> the truth of the matter is that we've all done things in the moment. 
it seemed like that's a good thing to do. And as soon as you do it, you realize, oh, if only I had thought in the 30 seconds. Would I like to take that one back? And here's the truth. You can't change your past. But let me tell you what else is true. You can forgive yourself. You can choose not to have your future defined by what's behind you in your past. Through Christ, God has forgiven you. He invites us into a God-filled life that includes forgiveness, healing, new life, freedom from your past. I'd like to share with you a passage from 2 Corinthians. And this is the truth and the essence of our faith. It says that 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And Christ did die for all of us. He died so we could no longer live for ourselves, but for the one who died and was raised to life for us. And so we are careful not to judge people by what they seem to be, though we once judged Christ in this way. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The past is forgotten. Everything is new. Anyone who belongs to Christ is a new person. The past is forgotten. Why do you keep holding on to it? Everything is new. And maybe today you are longing, thirsting for peace, rest for your soul. Well, God stands ready today to give you lasting peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding. And here's the peace, peace of peace that you need to know. The real peace is found in a person, not a place, not a state of mind. And somebody says, my life doesn't seem peaceful. And you're right, life is not always peaceful. Especially when our faith gets distracted, our priorities get mixed up, we lose focus on what matters in life. And what about when your circumstances change and life turns upside down? Then, then where's the peace? Remember, peace is a person, not a place. When life around us changes, we can trust in the fact that God does not. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God has not changed. God does not change. His love is forever. His faithfulness is always. Now religion, the man-made institutions, those might change. And let's be honest, they probably need to change. And let's be honest again. The man-made institutions, as I look around the room, is full of sinners. Brokenness and hypocrisy. The man-made part of religion is not always something that Christianity can look back on and be very proud about. And so I don't know that I have the power or the authority to do that, but let's be honest, when has that ever stopped me from uh, taking a stab up here? <laughs>
And look, everybody's welcome. Come as you are. I mean that. I hope that that long welcome, you know, I hope they think your big skull enough that you're like, oh, everybody is welcome. Um, but sometimes if you've had an extended absence, it's kind of easy to slip in here and start feeling, you know, I should be doing something more with my life. I should have been doing something better. I wish I could have done this. I wish that I had not done that. So sometimes people come in and they feel anxious. They come here and they start feeling pressure. They regret decisions that they've made over the past year. We start to wonder, what's going to happen next year? Where is my life going? It's been such a hard season, and nobody wants a season of hard times to come. But when they do, it has a way of making you ask, what is it that I'm counting on? What am I building my life on? Is there anything solid enough that, that circumstances beyond my control cannot take it away? And that's why I look forward to Easter. It's when we gather to remember the only hope capable of sustaining human life through everything that comes our way. One of my favorite living authors, John Workberg, says this, people have not gathered for the past 2,000 years to say, the stock market has risen, it has risen indeed. They have not gathered to say, the dollar has risen, it has risen indeed. The employment rate has the gross domestic general voters, your 401k. Here's the one hope that has held up human beings across every continent, across every culture for two millennia through difficult times of poverty, disease, pain, hardship, and death itself. Christ is risen, is risen indeed. And because he has died for the sin of the world, he has been raised from the dead. We can trust that his power and his love are real. He keeps his promises. By trusting our life and our future to him, we have peace with God. The abundant life, both in this life and the life to come. So here is me encouraging you. Accept God's invitation to hit the reset button on your life today. Until you accept that God loves you just the way that you are, there is nothing in this world that is going to make sense. Until you can accept it, welcome it, believe in the love of God, fill your heart, soul, and mind with this truth, life is not going to make any sense. And I believe that with all my heart, soul, and mind. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to guide us through a short time of prayer. And if you want to take a step closer to God, in your heart, in your mind, you don't even have to do it out loud. You can just kind of say, yes, God, me too. I'd like to hit the reset button today. So let's pray, please. You can pray this prayer just in your mind. You can say, dear God, I'd like a fresh start in life. I don't want to stay the same. There are things in my life I know need changing. And so as much as I know how, I want to open up my mind to your power, open up my heart to your grace. Thank you for loving me and for forgiving me. Jesus, I want to open up my life to your love and your grace and your power to change. I want to get to know you. I invite you to be the manager of my life. From this day forward, to start making the changes that I want and you want in my life, I want to learn to trust you. Thank you. Amen. If we could get the lights, uh, it behooves me to say that, that faith is something that, that is much more than one hour a week. Faith is something that, that fills us with the goodness of God each and every day. We're all imperfect, but, but we try to do better each day, right? We try to live with goodness and love and joy in our hearts. Here's the piece that, that maybe you need to know. You cannot do it alone. So we've asked a few of our people here to speak about what things have helped their faith grow. And so I invite you to watch this short video that we have got prepared for you. Good morning. Another beautiful day in the Keys. And welcome to the Kirk of the Keys. 